Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and today I wanted to have kind of a follow-up to my conversation about um, overlaying different information or systems or styles onto tarot, kind of marrying alchemical or cultural uh, information or teachings or practices onto the tarot and introduce a slightly different concept, which is just reinterpretations of tarot that aren't necessarily linked to a specific um, established system. Um, and the way I want to do that is to do a comparative walkthrough of three decks that are published by the Spanish uh, card maker Fournier. I have here in front of me the Tarot de Luz, the Tarot de Carlotides, and the Tarot del Fuego. Um, and I really like uh, what Fournier's been doing lately. I believe all of these decks um, have been published fairly recently um, in 2021. So I only have a few of these decks to present to you. Um, but I think Fournier are really branching out. And what I appreciate about them as a publisher is that unlike places like Llewellyn or Los Carabeo, U.S. Games, Hay House, Red Feather, um, that keep seem to keep regurgitating the same stuff over and over. Either it's recolored Rider Waite Smith decks, or it's the same kind of culturally appropriative uh, New Agey, you know, masculine energy decks, or feminine energy decks, or goddess decks, or you know, all all these themes that seem to be very popular. Um, Fournier is actually just publishing artists that are interpreting the tarot in their own ways and in in very different ways from each other. Uh, one thing I did want to point out that's um, a criticism of Fournier as a publisher is that while they do include a booklet with every deck, it is the exact same booklet for every deck. Um, and I guess Los Garbio does this as well, although sometimes they will give you a little bit more history of the artist or the art um, or something about the specific deck that you have in your hands. Uh, Fournier does not do that. What they do is they just put a different cover on their little booklet and then it is identical text um, in several languages uh, once you get into the um, the written text here. So that's something that could be improved. I would love to have, you know, an artist biography and maybe an artist statement at the very minimum, um, even if they're just going to go with textbook definitions of the cards, um, at least give me a little bit more information about the artists themselves. Um, so, you know, in, in trying to quote unquote learn these decks, I don't think that these are valuable at all. And I would just simply read them based on your own reading style, uh, your own knowledge, and, you know, hopefully your intuition and the inspiration that you get from the imagery. I think what I appreciate most as a reader of tarot is that reinter reinterpretations or fresh imagery helps me get away from some of the memorized keywords or associations that I've, you know, started out with. I, I try to get away from those in general, even when I'm reading with more traditional decks, but it can be easy to fall back into those learned patterns of associations, um, especially if you're having a tough day reading or if you're trying to read for yourself. Um, those kind of stereotypical associations can come up and I think um, they can really get in the way sometimes. And so having decks like these that break away from traditional imagery and give you something else to sink your teeth into, give you some different imagery to stimulate your imagination and your subconscious um, can really enrich your reading experience and get you out of a rut, get you away from cliche. So let me tell you a little bit more about these three decks on the table and then we're just gonna have a comparative walkthrough. I'm gonna try not to talk during the walkthrough too much, um, but I'll give you a little bit of background on these three decks. So uh, on the left here, we have the Tarot de Luz, and it's by Ator Ator Saraiba. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Um, I will link to these three artists uh, in the show notes below this video. Um, each of them does have an Instagram instance with examples as well as a website. So I'll link to their information. But this is the box. 
Um, you can see it does have the Fournier mark made in Spain down here. Um, the production quality on all these decks is similar. These cards are a little bit smaller than a traditional tarot size, which makes them easier to shuffle, and that's nice. Um, here are the backs of the Tarot de Luce, and as you can see, they're pink, and there is a lot of pink in this deck. In the middle here, we have the latest addition to my personal collection. Um, I will say I didn't buy the Tarot de Luce. Um, this was one that my mother was trying out, and she decided it wasn't really for her. And I can't say that it's really for me either. Um, I would rather have something a little bit harder hitting than this, but um, we'll look at the imagery together and you can kind of see how it compares. All right, so in the middle we have uh, Tarot de Carlo Tides, um, and this is by an artist named Carlotta Santos. I actually wrote her name on the box because it wasn't anywhere on the box, um, so that doesn't come on here. Um, but this is what the box looks like, um, and these are the backs, these beautiful floral and moon pattern. And then on the right we have Tarot del Fuego uh, by Ricardo Cavolo, um, and I believe all of these are Spanish artists. Here's the box for Tarot del Fuego. Um, and I should content warn before we start looking at cards that the Tarot del Fuego especially has a lot of eyeballs. A lot of eyeballs repeated and in weird places on bodies, um, and it also has a lot of blood and severed body parts. So if any of those things are off-putting to you, um, I think Tarot de Luz also has some extra eyeballs, but not to the extent that this one does. So if any of that kind of imagery is you know disconcerting or upsetting to you, then you may not want to watch the walkthrough. So again, just to repeat, um, these two decks I did purchase intentionally, um, and uh, have been working with a little bit, and I like reading with both of these for different reasons. I will also say that the Tarot de Carlotides, it's kind of like if these two decks merged in some ways. Um, it's a little bit punchier and less sweet than the Tarot de Luz, but it's a little bit more gentle and funny um, than the Tarot de Fuego. That's kind of an overview for you. So let's get started on uh, viewing these. I will show you just the title cards from each of these really quickly. So there you go. And like I said, I'm going to try not to talk my way through these. Um, I just want to show you the imagery. I did watch a, a walkthrough of the Tarot de Carlo Tides from another um, YouTuber. Um, and it was disappointing to me that as they were going through, they were kind of deciding um, on the spot what they thought each interpretation was. And I think that kind of um, defeats the purpose of looking at decks like these. Because if you go through, I know it's it's easy to kind of associate things and your, your mind automatically kind of wants to jump in and generate some information. Um, but if you allow yourself to do that and to like assign meetings right out of the box, then how are you going to have an open uh, reading of these when it comes to using them? Um, if you're just trying to peg everything to a so-called system or a set of assigned meanings that you've already memorized, I don't know, what's the point, really? Um, that's, I guess, what I would ask. So I think the advantage to using decks like these is that they are more open, um, they inject humor, they inject very different imagery, um, different emotion, different color palettes, and that's what's going to help you to get out of a rut or get away from stereotypes. Um, one thing I am noticing is that because the uh, Tarot de Carlotides is in two languages and they've shrunk the artwork down to make room for this, it's, it's uh, less clear in the detail um, because these two decks have almost a full bleed. Um, they're almost borderless. So I would have liked to see this one with slightly larger imagery, especially because some of the line work is pretty fine. Um, and I love this Hierophant card. When I first saw it, I was a little bit taken aback, um, you know, with the Cardinal having uh, tea with a bunny. Um, but there's a lot 
that you could get out of an image like this in terms of what innocence is, what leaders do, what teachers are like, the interplay between learning something and being indoctrinated in be being indoctrinated into it as a child versus, you know, someone with a lot of experience or that's been in a particular religious faith for a long time. And something else I uh, that occurred to me is that, you know, this figure is being drawn here by a Spanish artist where Catholicism is still very much a cultural um, touchstone, even for people who are not practicing Catholics. Um, but what if this was the Dalai Lama? What if this was, you know, some other religious figure? How would that kind of change my attitude towards this image? And so using that, I can kind of plug in anybody, any uh, religious or cultural leader here and use that as well. Um, so that's just one example. But I like um, how each of these has a very different uh, look at, at the card. And some seem more traditional. Um, this one would seem to be uh, based on the famous painting by Klimt, The Kiss. This one over here is, you know, suggesting Marseille. We have a, a male figure here, and then we have a two-headed female figure instead of two distinct women. And then here we have kind of a classic lover's embrace. So, but in each of these, you get um, sort of a different take than just straight up Marseille or um, the Pamela Coleman Smith image of the lovers. So I like that a lot. Um, I like how each one has a distinct color palette. Over here on the left we have a nice watercolor and soft um, earth tones and pastels. On the right obviously we have these very intense uh, reds and oranges and electric colors. And then in the middle we get an interesting mix between um, sort of almost monotone cards like this and then brighter color cards with a lot of pink and purple and blue in them. Um, and we'll see that as we go. So I just invite you, um, if you haven't already, you could even turn off um, the audio. Uh, I'm not gonna necessarily babble at you the whole time, um, but you could turn off the audio and just kind of look at the cards and think about what you might say about this card in a broader context if it came up in a reading um, or how the three different images give you more information about a card than just your standard um, you know tarot guidebook kind of definitions Um, one thing too I'll point out about these Fournier decks is that um, at least the uh, the one in the middle, the Tarot de Carlotides and the Tarot de Fuego, um, have a certain amount of queer imagery to my eye. And this devil card would be uh, one. We have two female presenting figures instead of a male and a female. Um, and then the Tarot de Fuego in particular has some imagery as we get uh, get through here that looks very trans to me. Um, so again, I appreciate that too, is that, you know, not only are these artists pushing the traditional imagery in terms of arrangement of objects or presentation of uh, posture and poses and backgrounds, 
but they're also doing things um, culturally to modernize, um, to recognize people uh, from different identities and backgrounds. Um, we do also have variation in the skin tone uh, across these decks. So there's, you know, there's more inclusion um, in all of these. And I think that's very uh, important, very valuable, um, especially for modern decks. There's really, you know, unless a modern deck is trying to interpret a very specific um, culture or, you know, historic movement that was focused in a specific, you know, group of people, um, I don't see why an imaginative deck shouldn't have some kind of diversity to it. It just doesn't make sense to me. Why can't there be, you know, black fairies? Why can't there be Asian vampires? Why can't there be South American gnomes? You know, if you're if you're just in the fantasy world or you're making up your whole pantheon, then you could make it diverse. And it's a choice. It's a choice not to do that. So those were the majors. Now we're into the wands suit. And I would hazard a guess that some people might struggle with imagery like this or like this that don't hew to the RWS or to the Thoth system or to the Marseille, uh, whatever they is kind of their root, you know, what they started out with. But I also feel like that's a lack of imagination. Um, you don't have to lock in your meanings. Um, if you do that, you're just kind of regurgitating. You're not really interpreting imagery. And you might as well just use a tarot app and, you know, get a computer or an AI to give you a tarot reading if that's all you're going to do. So I like this because it breaks me out of that because I can follow it into, um, you know, cliche and uh, learned meetings too, um, depending on my mood. Again, depending on how well I feel I'm reading in a particular day, what, uh, what information's coming to me when I lay cards out, sometimes I can be kind of stumped and it's easy to fall back into those things. But again, as I was saying before, if you have a deck that doesn't let you just get away with that, um, then, you know, that can be really helpful. Um, and it can break you out of that cliche style of reading. interesting uh, portrayal of age uh, among these three cards. We have almost a child king here. Um, we have a, I would say that's a young person, um, a young adult in this middle card, and then an old man with a gray beard, bald, um, and uh, looks like his body is, you know, he's got a lot of uh, medical aids here. His, his limbs are all replaced with uh, artificial ones. So very interesting.
It's also interesting to me that the Tarot de Luz in, does include a um, Hebrew letter, a Kabbalist uh, association, as well as um, an astrological association here. But I don't know, um, I don't use these systems and I haven't memorized this, so I don't know how well these um, symbols and their meanings match the card imagery. So if you use astrology or Kabbalah in your readings, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts um, particularly on the uh, deck on the left. How does the symbols and what they mean match up with the card imagery? And I will say that the um, Tarot de Carlo Tides uh, in the center here does um, hew closest to the RWS of the three of these. There's a few um, cards throughout this deck that you know seem to draw heavily on Pamela Coleman Smith's imagery, but it's only a few. It's a handful, I would say, um, and even that handful is, you know, a slight uh, variation on uh, her imagery. I love this horse trying to stand in this little tiny cup down here. I just find this really funny. I really like this Two of Swords. It's like a bride and a widow. Um, I've never seen uh, that kind of imagery on a tarot card before, but I like it a lot for the Two of Swords. And it's funny because um, even in uh, modern decks that are, you know, closer to the RWS, sometimes you find that artists are able to break away from the stabbed heart imagery, and sometimes not. And uh, the Three of Swords is often one of those cards where, you know, I get a little disappointed when somebody can't think of something else to put on it. Um, so I appreciate that Tarot de Luz goes in a completely different direction here. But these are okay, and uh, this is actually um, female genitalia down here, um, so that that certainly adds something to the interpretation or to the imagery. Um, and then here we have three swords, but they're in an apple, not a heart. So.
um, Renee over at Meadowlark Mystic um, has the uh, Tarot de Fuego in her collection and she was just doing a collection video, I was watching it today, um, and when she got to this deck she pointed out that the Pentacle suit is probably the hardest hitting in the deck. It's the most brutal and bloody and um, you know severing uh, body parts and that kind of thing. Um, you know here we're we're all broken out in these thorny um, sores uh, all over the face so it's an interesting choice for uh, one of the traditionally softer suits. All right, so that is it for the walkthrough. I think what I wanna do next is just do a comparative reading. So I'm gonna shuffle the um, Tone de Fuego. Uh, we'll do a question and I'll lay out three cards and then I'm gonna look at how that reading looks if we switch decks and pull the same cards. All right, so here's the first iteration of my sample reading. And let's say for the uh, sake of argument that we have uh, someone who's looking at switching jobs. And so they're they're asking, you know, what will happen is if I take this new opportunity that I've been offered. Um, and so here we have um, the Tarot de Fuego again, and we have the Seven of Wands, Eight of Swords, and Three of Cups. And so just based on the imagery, um, I might say something like, you know, this is going to be a heavy lift for you. Um, it's not going to be easy at first. You're going to feel like there's just a lot coming at you, a lot that you need to bring into the job, and then a lot being, um, you know, put on you as well in terms of expectations, learning curve, um, and effort. Um, but that with, you know, an intense concentration of your mental faculties and your ability to, you know, not be distracted and really focus on the work ahead, that it's really going to help you grow. Um, it's going to help you grow your skills and it's going to help you grow your, you know, your contentment and your, um, your confidence in your field and help you get to the next stage of um, expertise. 
in your field. So it, it could be a, a great opportunity, um, but it's not going to be an easy one. Okay. So that may be how I read it based on this imagery. Let's see uh, what the Tarot de Luz has to offer in contrast. Okay, so again, we're looking at our client's question of what will happen if I take this new job opportunity. Um, here in this uh, Seven of Wands, it doesn't have that powerful burden of the imagery of the uh, the previous deck. This person looks like they're kind of dancing uh, into a situation and dancing along with these other elements. So I would say that it feels very uh, organic and energizing to join this new company. Um, however, you're still going to have to to use all of your acquired skills, your your innate knowledge that you've absorbed and built up over your previous career, um, and really harness that mental power. We've got clouds here. Um, harness that mental power and uh, and that concentration, that ability to buckle down and get the work done um, in order to uh, blossom and to have this be a fulfilling um, and you know experience a fulfilling next step in your career um, so yeah this reads a little bit differently uh, still along the same lines and still quite positive um, but you can see how the change in imagery kind of changes the tone of the interpretation potentially um, so let's see what the third deck has to offer all right, so here, um, when our client asks us, uh, what will it be like to take this, you know, if I take this new job, um, I would suggest that with this interpretation of the Seven of Wands or this imagery, you know, we have this figure um, who's kind of above everything that's going on down here. And so it might be that they're uh, being placed in a senior role over other people that have been there for a while. And that could be challenging to see them coming in at this higher level uh, and, you know, getting all this recognition as like, oh, the new person, you know, the new person, the new person. Um, and so there's all these accolades, but there could be a certain amount of potential jealousy arising from that and that that could create um, some conflict for them. Um, as they settle into this new position, there could be, you know, kind of a, a, a darker feeling of, you um, expectation and pressure put onto them and so again they're going to have to use their mental faculties they're going to have to use their um, inner vision and strength of what they know that they're capable of to get them through this adjustment period of coming in as the new person who's you know sort of being put on a pedestal and then coming in and settling into their job um, and really showing what they're capable of. Um, but if they can do that successfully, that, that they will integrate then into the group. Um, something else that is interesting to me um, about these three particular cards is that they all have this um, sun or moon, some kind of celestial round object in the background. And I'm not necessarily going to say what that is or what that means, but there's certainly a rhyme here going on uh, visually. And that's one way that I work with the cards is to look at um, different rhymes. You also have little growths down here. So you have like grass or little plants um, in this ground of the Eight of Swords. And then you have blossoming flowers here in the Three of Cups. So I might say that, you know, like it goes from um, bare sticks, something that looks like a dormant rhizome or, you know, something like that. If you've ever worked with like hops or old roses, you know, you, you get these um, kind of plants that look like they're dead and then you plant them in the ground and you cultivate those and then they blossom for you. So I can see a progression here as well um, just with this imagery. So those are my three you know quick reads um, and just kind of an example of how the imagery can break you away from a lot of cliche readings and um, you know help you integrate different ideas into your readings when you're approaching tarot. Uh, so please let me know what you thought of these three decks. Um, if anyone is interested in uh, the Tarot de Luz, feel free to reach out by email, uh, waterchildtarot at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to send you this. Um, I can appreciate the you know, artistry behind this deck, but the imagery doesn't quite work for me, and I'm not going to be um, hanging on to this uh, in my collection. But it could work well for you, especially if you like this kind of softer softer palettes and kind of cuter imagery. Um, I will be uh, working with, I think, this um, Tarot de Carlotides. I'm, I'm very excited to continue working with this and exploring it and seeing how it reads. 
And then this Tarot de Fuego is always like punchy and, you know, cuts to the chase, um, but also has a sense of humor to it, um, a sense of surrealist humor. So um, I like this one because it's not, uh, to me, it's not too harsh. It's just, it's the right kind of cheeky sarcasm um, that everyone needs sometimes, that kind of tough love um, energy when you're stuck in a rut or you're feeling sorry for yourself or something like that. I usually pull pull this deck for that kind of a mood. So let me know what you thought of these readings and decks. Um, if you have any of these, if you've read with them, um, or if you're thinking about getting any other of the, of the uh, Fornia decks that I mentioned, let me know what you think. And until next time, I will see you.